Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for logging on today for our final Connect Talks of our virtual connections event, Spotlight on Asia Pacific. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Michaela Jacobe. I am the founder and managing director of Connections, the international private community for trusted decision makers in the high end travel sector. We're thrilled to have Chief Executive Officer of Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA, Mario Hardy, join us once again for our final Asia Pacific Connect Talks. This time, he will be moderating our distinguished panels of tourist board leaders. Before I hand over to Mario, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure many of you will have used Zoom by now, but if not, please can I ask you all to place yourself on mute. During this session, please ask questions by using the chat button that you will find at the end of your screen, at the bottom of your screen. My team and I are here at hand if you want to ask them direct questions and we will put them to the panelists. Mario will try to answer as many questions as possible and would be happy to connect also following the session should you not have time for all of your questions. This session will last up to one hour and it is being recorded. So if any of your colleagues or friends who you believe might also find this session useful, we will be distributing the recorded webinar in, in the coming days. Finally, as this session is live, anything can happen if for any reason um, you drop off, please rejoin and um, we will rectify the situation as soon as possible. So that's all from me. Mario, as always, it's a real pleasure working with you. So without further ado, it's now over to you. Thank you, Michaela. Great pleasure to be with you and everyone else. I see many friends, many some new people also that uh, are actually joining today. And again, welcome to everyone. Welcome to our panelists and of course, to you as the guest. Um, just before we start, I'd like to maybe just go with a, a very brief introduction to each of the panelists joining me today. Uh, first is Mr. Dorji Drado. Uh, he's the Director General of the Tourism Council of Bhutan. Uh, he served as a Zongda, uh, Governor of Gaza District for almost four years, and he has worked in various capacities in the field of agriculture research, policy and development. Uh, Mr. Drado was also the Founding Director of the Department of Agriculture Marketing and Corporations, the Founding Registrar of the Cooperatives of Bhutan. He published number, a number of articles on subject uh, relevant to national newspaper uh, and novel titles like Escapade, Awakening, and so much more. So, Kuzu you know, thank you very much for joining. Uh, Mr. Jean-Marc Mousselin, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Tahiti Tourism. He has spent his career in the International Deluxe Hotel at Brands, uh, which took him from Europe to Africa to Fiji, Tahiti, and of course here in Thailand, where he's very well known and respected. Uh, during his time in Tahiti, Jean-Marc was also the driver of the new Hotel Labour Collective Agreement and initiated a service charge with, which became a law in French Polynesia, making tourism industry more attractive for employment. In May 2017, he was called to set up the New Caledonia Tourism Development Agency and then led the New Caledonia Tourism. In May 2020, at the peak of COVID-19 crisis, he made the brave decision of returning, returning to the islands of Tahiti as the CEO of Tahiti Tourism. And lastly, Mr. Toyin Mohamed. He is the Managing Director of Visit Maldives, a position he has held since 2018. Uh, Toyin began his professional career in television in the Maldives. His expertise in diverse media, management and public relations earned him the position of Chairman of MMPRC in 2009 while serving as the Minister of State for Tourism, Art, Culture, and Finance Executive. In 2019, with the collective help of stakeholders and, and industry partners, to you work, some Maldives uh, welcome over 1.5 million tourists, a groundbreaking record number for the Maldives. He continues leading the Visit Maldives team to the pandemic to keep Maldives at the forefront as one of the most dreamed about destination throughout the recovery process. So thank you all uh, three gentlemen for joining me today. 
And uh, I'd like to actually start the session with uh, something uh, uh, a little bit different. I'd like to actually, uh, for a bit of an icebreaker for today, to ask you, what does the word luxury mean to you? What, the first, what are the first words that come to your mind when we actually talk about luxury? And maybe we'll start with uh, Jean-Marc, please. All right. Um, I think for me, uh, it will be uh, the word of uh, slow tourism, uh, which is for me the new luxury. Uh, the trend is, is this world is where everything is so uh, instantaneous and where people are stressed and constantly running after time. Uh, this is even more relevant in the context of this pandemic where people have been confined and restricted for, for so many months. So for me, people are dreaming of traveling, but on an authentic mode where one can take into when one can take time into to experience culture, to experience people, to reconnect with themselves and with nature and in peace, of course. So back to the essential. For me, it's slow tourism. Thank you very much, Oma. And uh, tell you, what does luxury mean to you? In my opinion, it's about great comfort and, pro and providing um, luxurious or expensive or beautiful positions or surroundings. It, it can include food or something, a service enjoyed upon. A um, little bit pricey, of course, but it should be more enjoyable as well. Dorji. Yes, to me, nothing can be more luxurious than being happy. So I guess happiness is a luxury to me. Yeah, I love your answer. That's really good. Thank you very much. Um, what we'll do actually next is we'll cover each one of the destinations maybe in a little bit more detail. But before we do that, what I also like to share with you is I've been privileged enough to travel to all three destinations multiple times um, and enjoyed every single one of my trips in, in all three destinations. When I think about Bhutan, I think about peace, fresh air, beautiful nature, and deep-rooted culture. I'd like to hear from you, Dorji. What is your three-minute elevated pitch about Bhutan? Why would people want to visit Bhutan? Why should we go and visit you? OK, thank you very much, Mario. So yes, uh, I would I'd like to say Bhutan is different. Of course, all destinations will be different, but we feel Bhutan is uniquely different. Different in the sense that, uh, uh, as of now, uh, we are not so uh, overwhelmed uh, with the tourists or with the population. And this is mainly due to our far-sighted visionary tourism policy of high value, low volume, which started as early as 1970s when we started the tourism. So because of that, today, the brand Bhutan, I mean, uh, we have this unique uh, brand Bhutan. Uh, so few, few elements uh, that should excite or encourage the tourists to visit Bhutan would be one is, of course, so as I said, uh, uh, the happiness. We very much believe our development philosophy is based on happiness, gross national happiness, which is an alternative uh, uh, model for grow, a development based on gross domestic product. So therefore, our tourism policy of high value, low volume is also based on this gross national happiness. So therefore, we, we are uh, supposed to be, uh, I mean, we, we, we are happy, basically, I mean, uh, so therefore, any guest that comes to Bhutan, we hope that uh, uh, they will be also happy. So as I said earlier, even when we talk about you know, luxury, now uh, happiness will be the ultimate aim of a, a being a luxury. So therefore, if you are looking for a luxury, if you are looking for a happiness, then Bhutan is the place and we have the natural environment, we have the culture, we have the, uh, I mean, basically the clean air, the clean water. So basically, I think if you want to be a little bit more happy, happier, then come to Bhutan. Good, I'll, I definitely support that. I've been, I believe, I have stopped counting at least five or six times to Bhutan. And every time I go back, um, I, it's, uh, I discover something new. So always enjoy, enjoy my visit. Next, I'd like to talk about the, the islands of uh, Tahiti. Um, when I think about Tahiti, I think Monoi, I think uh, Polini, Polynesian language. I think of the food, the landscape, the beautiful ocean, and an absolutely fascinating culture. So your elevated pitch, Jean-Marc, about Tahiti. Uh, three minutes is very short. <laughs> so uh, I need to locate Tahiti first because I think most, a lot of people don't know. So it's, 
actually they're located in the middle of the South Pacific, halfway between Australia and West Coast of America. It's surrounded by crystal clear turquoise lagoon with uh, 118 volcanic islands and coral atolls. So we have both spread over an area as big as Europe. Uh, although our population is only 300,000 islanders. Uh, the island of Tahiti are known for their natural beauty, of course, with, uh, from white sand beaches to volcanic peaks and tropical forest, uh, authentic Polynesian culture, like you mentioned, with a unique touch of French Polynesian art de vivre. Um, so there's only a handful of islands that have opened to tourism and, uh, off, and offer a variety of accommodation experiences from a patient family guest house uh, to luxurious resort or private island with the famous over the, over the water bungalow uh, whose, uh, whose concept was actually invented here in the 1960s, including the glass doors where you can see, you can observe the lagoon by transparency. Uh, there's, there are also a few charters and a couple of resident cruisers sailing the islands. But Teddy has always been a mythical paradise that inspired explorers, writers, painters over the centuries, uh, starting with the sailors of, of the ship, the Bounty ship, whose crew actually mutinated, mutinated, sorry, to stay uh, in this island of beauty. Uh, so even today, this myth is, is actually perpetrated by the numerous celebrities uh, who visit uh, our islands. Now, beyond the sports car, when you arrive in Tahiti, the visitor's senses are immediately caught by the scent of the flower lay offered to you by the enchanting Polynesian music and culture. Uh, and of course, the sweetness of, of the temperature, but what catches travelers, travelers most is the authenticity and the friendliness of the Polynesians. There is a, a familiarity here which may surprise at first, but uh, which puts you at ease and allows you to let go very quickly, uh, whether you are uh, in Tahiti when you arrive. So whether you're a celebrity visiting here, a president or a Mr. Nobody, the taxi driver will actually, or the maid or the waiter, will treat you as equal. Not by disrespect, but because in the local culture, there is a little sense of hierarchy or social class. A good demonstration is, you know, that in French, you have two ways to addressing people. Vous, which is a polite way when you are owe oh, respect to someone, or tu, uh, the familiar way where, where, uh, when you are at the same level or the same social level. Well, in Tahiti, everyone said to each other. That's a good example. Now, of course, when you're in a five-star resort, the staff will follow the brand standards. But as soon as one scratches the surface, the natural behavior will, will take over. And the best tip that you can give to our visitors is the nicer you are with your interaction with the population, the better your experience will be and exceeding your expectation by far. I, I would totally agree with you. Uh, the moment I landed in, in the, the islands of Tahiti a few years ago, uh, I felt at home. Uh, people smiles and are extremely welcoming, and uh, uh, it's, it was really fantastic. I keep really, really good memories of, of the trips I've done there. Um, thank you, Jean-Marc. And then, lastly, for for you, uh, you know, the islands of Maldives have probably made a lot of people dream around the world. Um, and when we think about the Maldives, you know, we 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 think of, uh, of course, you know. Uh, Islands, white sandy beaches, blue lagoons, exclusive resorts, one island, one resort. Um, what can you tell, me, tell us more about the Maldives? <laughs> yes, uh, Mario, Maldives is a picture perfect archipelago located in the middle of the Indian Ocean and home to 1,190 plus tiny coral islands. We are popular for the extraordinary beauty it offers and is justly celebrated as one of the best travel destinations in the world. Our islands are surrounded by white sandy beaches, turquoise blue waters, coral reefs teeming with colorful marine life. We are well known for its unique concept of one island, one resort, as you just said, meaning that one resort occupies the whole island. These islands are beautifully and naturally distanced from each other, providing the physical distancing one needs during this time. And this is what the element in which we are using for our advantage to promote Maldives during this pandemic. As traveling has begun again in several countries, travelers yearn for a safe holiday, secluded in their surroundings where physical distancing is practiced on its own. 
And luxury is a massive part of the travel industry in Maldives. Mario, as you ask, can start it. We offer a variety of luxury rooms and accommodations to stay in along with innovative restaurants, fashionable spas, which cater to all types of wellness needs and other grand amenities, all of which captures the attention of wealthy tourists, upscale travelers, and global trendsetters. This has inspired hospitality brands to create and adapt numerous methods and experiences, some of which are unmatched and unique only to Maldives. World's first underwater restaurants, also underwater spas, rooms, bubble tent are some to name. Not only does Maldives have luxury resorts, it is also home to luxury liverpools. That's similar smaller versions of luxury yachts, one of the four tourism products of the destination. It's a great assortment of liver boats come in various sizes, shapes, and standards. Naturally, Maldives is not solely dedicated to wealthy tourists. It offers various lodging options catering to a diverse range of preferences. They are broadly categorized into resorts, hotels, guest houses, and liver boats. These aspects make Maldives the ideal destination right now, as it offers two of these much desired factors by tourists, safety and a broad, broad range of accommodation options. Ever since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been marketing Maldives as a safe haven for all travelers, especially since the reopening of borders last year, July 15. Our marketing efforts heavily revolve around this aspect and we have stringent health and safety measures in place to curb the spread of virus. In addition, we are thrilled to say that today we are one of the first countries to provide the free COVID-19 vaccine for all citizens and residing, residing citizens in Maldives. Until yesterday, a total of 85,000 plus has been vaccinated. Of course, with the, uh, we have a very small population of 400,000 uh, plus. In fact, to make the tourism industry a more risk-free environment, a program to vaccinate all tourism industry staff has also been start initiated. With these necessary measures in place, we would like to assure everyone that we are ready to greet you with open arms as we always have been, and that we would love to see you back in the sunny side of life to rediscover the Maldives soon. Thank, Thank you. Much. That is very good. I, I'd like to actually stay with you and carry on our discussion. I know that you have to leave us a little bit earlier today. Um, you know, when I last visited the Maldives, uh, there was a lot of discussions in, internally within the government and within your office about uh, the need for diversification of the product offering. Uh, as you describe, and as most of us know, we know the Maldives as a luxury destination. Luxury normally equals, in people's mind, expensive. Um, and, but I know there was discussions to expand that the product offering to also attract the mid-tier and even to a certain degree, maybe the lower tier uh, potential visitors across the country. Um, you're in Atoll, you have got multitude of islands, uh, covers a very large territory also uh, from north to south and et cetera. And um, so just like us, like to hear from you in terms of an update on that strategy. Is it still part of the strategy moving forward and what steps have been taken so far? Yes, Mario, I've been in here for like two and a half years now with the new government, and we are very much in favor of all, all what you have said. We, we, we are, um, uh, the, our strategy is that. As I have mentioned, Maldives is not solely dedicated to wealthy tourists. We offer various accommodation options, and that's the policy of the government, which are categorized, as I said before, the resorts, the hotels, which are city hotels, the guest houses, which are some can say uh, homestays, including uh, liver boats as well. Cater all these caters to a diverse range of preferences and travelers. Ever since the relaxation of tourism rules from uh, a government, the guest house industry has boomed in Maldives. Many guest houses, specifically targeted for budgeted travelers, have been developed in inhabited islands where people, locals are living, with greater Male region being the main hub. Male is the capital. 
These guest houses range from budget to boutique to breakfast inns and more. And although the level of luxury may remain unmatched to that tourists, the guests are provided with the best service and hospitality and guests have access to similar types of activities that resorts offer. Opportunities for snorkeling, diving, excursions, dolphin watching to nearby islands are available at most islands as well. And the environment is also rather different in guest house islands as opposed to resorts. It offers the same friendliness, of course, warm welcome and hospitality, of course, but in fact, tourists are more often that than not invited into locals' houses for meal times, where they get to indulge in true Maldivian cuisine, which is very unique. And by staying at these islands, tourists also have the prospect of experience the rich history and culture of Maldives also. And again, the liverboards, as I said, it's a moving boat. It's luxury. It ranges from two to 20 rooms. You can have your own restaurant, your spa, your bar, everything moving around while you sleep or when you want. And our activities have been to promote all these uh, different products where, uh, as you rightly said, our government and what we are doing now is to uh, diversify the product we have. Of course, we are a premium destination, but of course, there are more affordable options available. Thank you. Actually, if you if you want to have the best uh, fish curry in the in the Maldives, ask a Maldivian and go with, go to their house and have a dinner with their family. Uh, it is extremely enjoyable, a little bit spicy. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you to you, uh, Dorji Kuzus uh, Ampola. I'd, I'd like to just uh, go over uh, some aspects of Bhutan. I think for many people, the kingdom of Bhutan is this very mysterious land in the Himalayas. Uh, we often, often on someone's bucket list of places to visit uh, in, in the world. Um, I've been fortunate to visit many, many times uh, the kingdom and it's uh, actually enjoyable every single time. It's probably not so well known as a luxury destination per se, uh, but is probably known for a, a, from some ultra net worth individuals uh, because of some of the wonderful resorts that you have, such as Uma Paro, uh, Jivaling, for example, or Aman Resorts, um, which are excessively expensive, uh, but actually worth every penny if you ever have the, uh, the pleasure of actually staying there. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to get a little bit of a perspective from you in terms of you know, your, your strategy in terms of development of luxury resorts moving forward. Are there more planned besides the Uma Paro, Jivaling? I know there are actually others. Those are not the only ones. Uh, but is there is there a focus from your government to maybe develop a little more the luxury market moving forward? Thank you, Mario. So first, firstly, I just like to agree with you. Uh, for most uh, people, Bhutan is a land of a mystery, very mysterious, and therefore I, I really don't want to talk much about Bhutan. I still want to mention that, make people wonder. I mean, what uh, Bhutan is, where Bhutan is, so that where they can come and uh, see it for themselves. Well, okay, now going uh, seriously to your question, luxury, yes, uh, to in Bhutan, uh, yes, uh, I would say luxury uh, has actually two definitions. One is the normal definition, which uh, Maldives has also talked about, and also you, you yourself, uh, wherein we talk about really high-end hotels, like uh, in addition to those hotels that you mentioned, we also have this very high-end called Six Senses. Six Senses are also here. And then we have Taj, we have Lamaritan. So yes, I mean, uh, these are, these are the, 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 the normal luxury that we are talking about. And yes, we also have a, still a plan to promote that also. But more than that, now going forward, Bhutan, in terms of luxury, we are talking about the, the luxury of being oh, well, wellness and well-being, this, this spiritual tourism. I mean, the luxury from mental side, actually. Well, the luxury, uh, can be, uh, as I said earlier, the, the physical and the mental. So I, I uh, feel that Bhutan will be actually specializing in the luxury towards more towards uh, the, the mental side, the, the spiritual side. Now, why we're saying this is uh, we are very well positioned actually uh, in terms of that, because as of now, Bhutan could be the only uh, country that uh, where we have this thriving uh, 
the the Mahayana or the Tantric uh, Buddhism. I mean, uh, so uh, so so the place becomes very uh, gives you this uh, the the whole the environment for being uh, spiritual. So I'm talking about that, and also our luxury can go right down to the village level. For instance, we are talking about homestays, village homestays. While the physical luxury may not be there, but then we are talking about giving another kind of a luxury called the the natural setting, the the the, the cultural uh, uh, luxury, the agricultural luxury the ecotourism luxury. So we're actually going to, to us that. So yes, uh, uh, we, we, the government wants to promote uh, uh, luxury, but uh, in, in, in this newer aspect also. And also I'd like to stress here, by any way, our policy of high value, low volume, the high value, low volume basically narrowed down to giving an exclusive experience to the tourists. So therefore, when we talk about exclusive, exclusivity, we are also talking about luxury. So therefore, uh, there's no doubt that Bhutan wants to promote this so-called the luxury or the wellness or well-being, the exclusive uh, tourism, because our policy says so. And for, for, for some reason, I believe that though they say that nothing is written on uh, stone, nothing is permanent, but somehow I feel that for Bhutan, the tourism policy of high value, low volume, that uh, actually avoids mass tourism, the over tourism, that really focuses on the sustainable tourism. This is going to be carved in stone. I mean, we cannot change, change this for going forward. So this is what, uh, what I wanted to uh, tell. And also maybe you will give me later on the opportunity. I also wanted to say something. Anyway, just let me stop here. Yeah, sure, sure. We can come back later also. But I, I, I'd like to carry on also on the conversations about when, when I last visited your prime minister mentioned about the development of, uh, of a new area, the east part, the eastern part of Bhutan, which is, uh, was at the time, I don't know if it is today, uh, really accessible uh, for, for tourism at that time. There was actually no road actually traveling to the eastern part. Um, so just like to hear a little bit from, from you about the progress of that, because obviously uh, with, with the expansion of the road and access to the east, it also gives you potential to bring, uh, to welcome new tourists and obviously help with the local economy. Very right, Dr. Mario. Yes, the, uh, as of now, still tourism in Bhutan is focused in few areas like the Western part. So therefore the Eastern part, the central part, the Southern part are a bit of uh, off the radar. So therefore the, it is a government policy and initiative that we connect and make all the 20 districts. Bhutan is made out of 20, of 20 districts that all 20 districts gets, uh, uh, I mean, tourists. Uh, visiting them. So that is the policy, that is the plan, and we are working towards this. And even the physical accessibility, which you just touched upon, the road, I think since your last visit, I'm sure it must have uh, improved uh, substantially. And also, not only the physical access, we are also trying to promote the physical infrastructure there. For instance, we are talking about uh, supporting and developing the village homestays, maybe the accommodation, the roadside amenities, so it is a going to be a holistic approach, but just to answer your question directly, yes, Eastern part, not only East, but other parts of the country also, we are trying to promote and uh, the government's trying to provide support so that tourists can visit because every part of Bhutan is unique. Of course, it could be true with other countries or uh, destination also, but Bhutan we feel is uniquely different. Every, the next district is, uh, has a special thing to offer. So therefore it is in our advantage to promote all the places in the country for, for tourism. You know, the, the, the other question I'd like to ask, which I'm sure other, others are probably wondering, many countries around the world have looked at Bhutan and, and your tour, tourism policy uh, that you have in place with, with the limit in terms of capacity of uh, visitors on a yearly basis. Uh, have been seen by other countries as something they all wish they could actually do. Uh, it's not probably as simple, as easy in other destinations that it is in, in Bhutan because of the uh, you essentially have one airport, one point of entry, um, and uh, a, a little bit easier to control. But it's been the envy of many other destinations. What advice would you have to another destination who may be looking at Bhutan and say, hey, we, we'd like to set up something like that? Would you encourage them to do it? Does it work well? Oh, yes, yes, definitely, yes. Especially post-COVID. I mean, we feel the Bhutan's tourism policy of high value, low volume, and the various strategies that to support this 
should be the way forward post post covid because post covid now we are talking about wellness and well being the but the personal safety and the tourism our tourism policy in practice for last 50 years has been actually gearing around all this we are talking about sustainability we are trying to about mass tourism we are trying to about uh, over tourism and also our tourism is beyond revenue and receipts we are not just talking about making the maximum uh, revenue out of tourism we are being very careful as you said we are very much guided by the carrying capacity uh, high value low volume basically talks about again carrying capacity so that means i mean one very unique way of uh, implementing this carrying capacity is we have a unique system called minimum daily package rate which is a package which the tourists any tourists coming to bhutan they have to pay this in advance then only after getting paid then their visa will be approved so therefore that actually basically regulates the number of arrivals coming to our bhutan and of course I also like to clarify here, as of now, our rate is around 250 USD per person per day, but that is not just for visa fee. I just want to clarify this because most people get misunderstood uh, you know, by this. These $250 per person per day actually includes minimum of three-star accommodation, uh, uh, their all meals, their transport with a dedicated chauffeur and a dedicated full-time registered licensed tour guide. So this package includes this. So, so this is a one unique, and also the another unique uh, uh, element in Bhutan tourism is we charge every tourist what we call as sustainable development fee, and the present rate is USD sixty five dollars per person per per day. Now, this sustainable development fee again basically supports our tourism policy of high value low volume for for to maintain our resources, everything is uh, sustainable, but basically contribute ultimately contributing towards the world sustainability. So these are some of the very unique things. And I definitely like to recommend uh, to all the destinations. I mean, this is something that they could follow. And uh, Bhutan will be very happy to help. I mean, if they want to know more about this. Uh, maybe uh, uh, I think I'd like to request for another chance next time. I, I, I want to say something very uh, special. Please. No, please, please go ahead now. That's okay. Okay. So uh, earlier, earlier Maldives was talking about the uh, different categories of uh, tourist offer, like from budget to luxury, you no, know, which is very good. I mean, for Maldives, but for Bhutan, in fact, we are a bit different. As of now, in the process from last fifty years, they came about actually two types of uh, tourists. We have a so-called the dollar-paying tourists and the other tourists coming from Maldives, India, and Bangladesh. These three countries, India, Bangladesh, and Maldives, uh, tourists coming from this, they used to uh, uh, enjoy a special treatment. They don't have to pay the, the what I have said earlier, the minimum daily package rate. They just come here, they get their visa or permit, and then they just move, move around on their own. So they had this exception. And this actually, is, it was not by policy. It just somehow, it just happened. Now, very recently, we have approved a new tourism policy. And this tourism policy basically says we want to pursue one tourism, one tourism. That means regardless of their background, nationality, whether they come from Maldives, Japan, or Australia, or USA, they will be all treated as one tourist, the same tourist, and they will be paying the same thing. So this is what we are trying to say. So there will be no two types of or different types of category of tourists. We are just going to have one tourist. And this is something that uh, we, we want to really, you know, really promote. Uh, and also, I'd like to say that uh, because of our policy and also because of our uh, development philosophy based on gross national happiness, we really want to uh, pursue this, uh, meaning that uh, the number of tourists that comes here will be always regulated uh, depending upon our you know, carrying, uh, carrying capacity. So therefore, that means not anybody or everybody can come to Bhutan. I mean, there will be a minimum uh, package rates that they have to uh, uh, pay upfront. Uh, and normally, uh, uh, we are being also kind of critiqued by saying that our tourism policy is elitist, basically saying that we are supporting only the high-end tourists. And I would say it is not, actually. So basically, our policy decision is to, in the interest of the global uh, world sustainability, and of course, uh, directly to, to our country, we want to be sustainable. We want to make sure that whoever comes here or we are responsible, we try to manage them and give them the best of the experience. So therefore, we will be anyway filtering out slowly uh, the so-called, uh, 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 I mean, uh, so, so, so therefore, basically, our, our tourism will be a high-end or an exclusive or a luxury tourism, in, in other words. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I see a number of questions coming from the audience, so we'll come back a little bit later to you. Now I'd like to actually move to the uh, beautiful islands of uh, Tahiti uh, with uh, Jean-Marc. And, uh, you know, when, when I first visited uh, the islands of Tahiti, I, I can't explain why I felt like I was going home. Although I actually was born in a very cold country, completely the opposite way of it. Uh, I was born in Quebec, in the northern part of it, so which is uh, extremely cold uh, in the winter. But uh, somehow I felt home. And I think it's something to do with something John Knock actually mentioned before. It's the warmth of the people when you arrive there. The smiles and uh, people are so welcoming. Uh, the food is fantastic. The music is great. The language is very colorful. Uh, and uh, uh, nature is beautiful. It's a combination of all of these things. It's a little bit of a dream destination, I think, for, for many people. Uh, but also a fact that is unknown by many. Uh, as Jean Marc mentioned, you have 118 islands spread over a very, very vast territory. Uh, for, for most people who are aware of Tahiti, we'll think of Papete, which is the capital, or the, the big island of Tahiti, Morea, or Bora Bora. But you have many other beautiful destinations across the, uh, across the destination. Is, is it part of the government's initiative or your office initiative to also try to expand and promote other islands for tourism? Uh, you're right, uh, Mario. Uh, only three or four islands, uh, and particularly Bora Bora, are, are the most visited. Uh, and indeed, uh, for the first flight, uh, for the first trip to France Polynesia, the majority of our tourists will visit the island of Tahiti, Mora, and Bora Bora, uh, which are the must do. But it's like going to Paris without going to the Eiffel Tower. So uh, this, this already takes, and just doing those three islands already takes a minimum of 10, 10 nights uh, in your program, which is you know quite quite long, especially when you add to this uh, the trip, considering that we are you know, in the middle of nowhere, uh, so to speak. Uh, so it is only when, when you have done those islands that uh, on your first trip that you realize that there are many more interesting islands and attractions to discover. So in other words, it's difficult to stop this trend. Uh, nevertheless, uh, one of the tourism's main strategy uh, and objective over the past few years has been to promote the diversity of our destination, moving away from the imagery articulated around Bora Bora and all over bungalows to put forward our culture and our people. But I mean, you don't need to do to be a marketing expert to, to, to realize that it is extremely difficult to put through uh, a, a campaign or a, a few image uh, about, about the people and the feeling that you have when you reach here. So uh, we have to keep somehow around this uh, postcard uh, image that attract the people here. But Nevertheless, this is seducing particularly returning visitors uh, who are caught to explore more. And, and indeed, uh, when we see, when, when we have seen a, a better distribution of our, distri of our visitors since, uh, since we are doing that, that, uh, that strategy. Uh, now there is a new strand, a new trend though, which, which helps uh, that part is that, and this has been clearly observed during this critical times is that our travelers are moving more and more towards the slow tourism that I was mentioning uh, earlier on at the beginning, uh, where they stay longer, they visit more islands, and they want to live an authentic experience uh, with, your, with the Polynesian, uh, which, you know, all this situation actually helps in that direction. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was mentioning before we started the uh, conversation today that over the weekend there was a, a TV series on, uh, on the French television on TV5 about uh, Rapa, which is one of the furthest islands, uh, which is also the highest, I believe, mountains you have in, in, uh, in French Polynesia. An actually beautiful area, but really far away from, from the capital city. I think it's 1,400 kilometers, if I'm not mistaken, uh, quite, quite a distance. But it actually shows how vast the territory is. Uh, I, I you know, agree with you what you mentioned about the guest house and, and we know that from the surveys we've been conducting since the beginning of a pandemic, there's an increasing desire for people to be, you know, visit more local places, to be away from the big crowded areas, uh, to spend more time in what I would call ecotourism or more in nature, a little distant from, from uh, others and et cetera. And but the one thing I also noticed when I did visit uh, uh, the islands of Tahiti I, I, is the fact that you cater for everyone. Uh, you can actually stay in a very uh, ultra luxurious uh, property. You can also stay in a very warm guest house with uh, local families. And uh, 
as, uh, as Toya mentioned for the Maldives, also enjoy local food with local families and et cetera. So you really cater for everyone uh, within the sector. Is it, is it part of a strategy or is it just something that happens naturally over, over uh, several years? Oh, absolutely. This is part of it. Right. It naturally happened <clears throat> first, uh, as we have seen people uh, during the same stay moving from a five-star five -star resort to a, to a pension or a guest house, because people are really attracted when they go so far. And I think the kind of, uh, of, of visitors that we have here are really, really more interested into not only the beauty of the island, but the culture and the people. So they want to experience, uh, you know, uh, living like the locals, uh, like the like the population. So they, they alternate actually from five star to, to pension and, and back to five star and even go to their private yard afterwards. So that's that's not uh, untypical. Obviously, we have more Europeans doing that kind of, uh, of trip. Uh, North Americans are, are more going towards the, the normal sort of uh, resorts. Thank you. Uh, you know, what, what are if you think of uh, Europe, you're relatively new. You've joined uh, a few months ago now, actually, in, in Tahiti tourism. What is, what is your vision for Tahiti tourism post-COVID-19? Well, um, first, we, we are working on the five of, the, of our next five years uh, tourism strategic development plan with our Ministry of Tourism at the moment. And what we've done is we've invited not only the tourism stakeholders, but the whole population to share with us uh, their vision on how the island of Tahiti tourist, uh, tourism of the future should look like. So we organize many debates in the islands, uh, involve the mayors of each municipality, talk to professionals. We open a website where everyone uh, could create its own topic of discussion in order to collect as many opinions and ideas. So these are currently being sorted and, and this will be integrated in a, in a strategy and made public in the, next, uh, in, a, in the next few weeks. But obviously we are moving towards uh, an inclusive kind of tourism that benefits more and more the population. Uh, prioritizing blue and green tourism, obviously, preserving nature and, and not in search of volume, but looking at quality. Um, we will obviously address uh, what was mentioned about the town, at what level we can set the limits of acceptability in terms of a capacity. But that's a big challenge, I must say. Yeah, but. My next question is, I realize it's probably not easy for you to answer at this stage during, during uh, COVID-19, but it was more about accessibility to the islands of Tahiti. Um, and essentially really post COVID-19, I know there were discussions when I last visited about expansion of adding more direct access to other destinations around the world. Um, do you see some progress being made in 2022 towards that uh, gaining more direct service from uh, other destinations? I believe we may have actually lost uh, Jean-Marc for a moment. While we're waiting for Jean-Marc to return, uh, maybe I'd like to go back to Dorji and ask you some questions that we receive also from the audience. Uh, what is the current situation in terms of uh, uh, tourism in Bhutan? So do, you, do you foresee a reopening of the borders sometime in 2021? Oh, we, we, we definitely hope, uh, at least in 2021. But uh, going by the present uh, situation in our country, especially COVID and also globally and regionally, I feel that for another three months, it will be very difficult. And also, uh, we feel that we will be uh, safe to open for tourism not only for our own citizens, but also for the tourists. And which we feel the first and foremost is we, we the government is already, already embarking on the nationwide vaccination. And it will be, again, free. The, the, the government is going to provide all this vaccine to all our citizens, and we are starting by March. So there will be two doses. So only by end of April, the second dose will, would have been completed. And then maybe by June, July, uh, technically, if the COVID situation remains the same, like uh, as of now, uh, then maybe there's a possibility. But I would say minimum for three next three months, there will be no uh, possibility of opening. But uh, we are hoping the next, uh, maybe by um, September, October, uh, things should be normal. I mean, but as you will all agree, it will really depend on the COVID-19 situation. Good. Well, as soon as you reopen, 
send me a message. I'll be on the first flight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we will, we will invite you. Yes, Mario. Thank you. Oh, you don't need to invite me. I'll go on my own, but I'm, I'm happy to come, come and visit. Just want to escape into your beautiful nature and uh, okay. see all my, my, my friends, which I know some of them are on the call today. Um, actually, uh, Gancho, just to actually pose a question too, which uh, is probably for me to answer. <laughs> Um, he, he asked uh, two questions specifically. One is about, should there be one digital or trusted travel pass or travel passport as the main information for traveler uh, moving forward for either for Asia or for, for the world? And it's a question I get asked numerous times a week from the media, but also from uh, guests like yourself on webinars. Um, yes, uh, the answer is, the short answer is yes, I do believe and I do hope that we get into a situation where we'll have whatever you want to call it, a travel pass or a passport that will keep record of who's been vaccinated, when you've been vaccinated, where you've been vaccinated, what type of vaccine you receive, and the same, same for testing. Uh, at the moment, there are multiple versions of it. Uh, IATA travel pass, the common pass from the common project. Uh, there's also uh, several private organizations who launched their own. A few countries have started to uh, come up with their own uh, travel pass or passports too. Um, but I do hope that at some point within the next, I would say, medium term, we do end up with a, a shorter list. Uh, because you can, as you imagine, as a traveler, having to carry multiple apps and multiple QR codes can get very, very confusing as you cross borders from one place to another moving forward. So uh, I do hope, and this is something that we as, our, as an organization at PATA are advocating really strongly with the respective governments uh, to ensure that um, one or two standards are to move forward at the very, very least, uh, on a regional basis, let's say ASEAN countries, for example, uh, moving forward. So uh, that's certainly my hope. Uh, the other question that also from Dan Cho, which is again, probably for me to answer, <laughs> uh, the future predict travel predictions. Uh, do I agree with the UNWTO predictions that uh, normal travel will resume by 2024? Yes. But let me, let me just explain this in a little bit more detail so I don't want to be misleading to anyone. When we talk, when UNWTO, PATA, or WTTC, or other organizations talk about um, having a, a recovery pre-COVID-19, we're talking about a global basis. So on a global basis, yes, our forecast and other organizations' forecast all see a recovery to the same level of growth, percentage growth, on a global basis to be around 23 or 24. Now, what you have to understand, this situation is extremely volatile. It changes by the day. So it's nearly impossible for someone or for any organization to have really precise forecast in this type of crisis. Things keep shifting and moving uh, quite frequently from, from time to time. And, but at the moment, based on the knowledge that we have, that seems to be a reasonable target. Now, what is also different for, for, for this crisis is that we see a reopening that will be gradual and uneven. So certain countries will actually be reopening uh, earlier than others. We know that in Asia, for example, Singapore, Hong Kong, Chinese Taipei are leading in terms of, of reopening at the moment. Other destinations will be similar too. Uh, Dorji just mentioned around maybe September, October in the third, third quarter, fourth quarter of this year, potentially reopening Bhutan. Other countries like the Maldives have been open already for quite some time. So it's really uneven. It will be gradual over that period of time. Uh, do we have Sean up back? I saw him coming in. Yeah, sorry, I got cut off. I don't know why. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, we can. I, I can see you too. So we'll, we'll come back to you and ask you the same question that was asking uh, the, the others, which is uh, the current situation of COVID-19 in, in the, the islands of Tahiti and when or how, what do you anticipate in terms of reopening? Do you, do you believe you'll be able to reopen so gradually in 2021? Not only we are believing, but we, we have opened on the 15th of July last year. So uh, we were one of the only destinations, one of the first to open. Uh, how did we manage that? First, I mean, maybe I give you a few tips of how we, we did that. Uh, is the first we the first thing we did is to ensure a constant communication with the trade on all our market feeders and uh, and our stakeholders in our islands. Uh, 
for that, we created a, a B2B digital dashboard so that all our partners uh, were aware of in real time what was happening here, the, the visitors entry facilities, the state of our borders, the status of each hotel's activity providers, whether they were open or not, uh, the status of our airlines, their, their new flight schedules. Then uh, we developed a big training program and preventive or protective measure, uh, as well as strict protocol adapted to each profession in our hotel industry, in our um, uh, tourism industry. I mean, hotels, restaurants, spa, et cetera. It is all adapted to each. Uh, so uh, we created video, video to, to be broadcasted on all the TV channels. We organized training in all our islands. The government even uh, created uh, a, a, an awareness, quite a COVID awareness, but with students in all the islands, scrolling to the city and the islands to advise people what to do and what not to do. Um, we also worked on travel, travelers' awareness uh, to protect themselves and our population with production of video clips that were produced, uh, produ produ I'm sorry, that were broadcasted on board the planes uh, before landing in Tahiti. Uh, now, our health protocol has been quite innovative. Not only we introduced the three days uh, RT-PCR test, of course, before arrival, but we were the first to introduce digital sanitary passport. Uh, that we call electronic travel information system um, that uh, we were that allow us to ensure that the, the, the travelers will respect the country's regulation, health regulation, that they have a travel insurance covering COVID-19, and most of all, where uh, you must they were specifying their their itinerary, their contact, so we can locate it, uh, locate them at any time, and and further to that. Uh, once the people arrive in Tahiti, uh, we have introduced a self-test COVID kit, uh, which was handed out to each arrivals, uh, to all passengers uh, that have, and they had to perform that self-kit, uh, uh, that self-test, I'm sorry, uh, four days later after arrival. So this was very easy uh, to identify, locate, and isolate any positive case. So this was very, very actually effective. Um, at the same time, we coordinated uh, with the local industry to sign a common reservation policy to waive amendment and cancellation fees, uh, as well as freeze all rates for until the end of 2021. And of course, in terms of marketing, we did a, a lot of uh, campaign, etc. We, we then opened on the 15th of July, and this was very courageous from our government, uh, but this was very successful. This not only we were able to prove that tourism were not the source of uh, spreading the pandemic, uh, thanks to our protocol, and because they were very uh, respectful of, uh, of, of the protocol as much as our local tourism stakeholders. But this allowed hotels, guest houses, activities providers, and their employees to remain open and to survive for the past six months, right? So this was really crucial to have a, a real proper um, uh, protocol uh, organized before the, the, the real meeting. You know, um, uh, Andrew, who you know really well here in, in Thailand, who's actually with us today, uh, sent me a question before that. I'd like to just change his question slightly. He was asking about the commonalities between you know, Thailand and Polynesia in terms of restarting tourism. I'd like to change that maybe a little bit based on what you just answered. You know, what, having lived in Thailand for many years and worked here uh, and understanding that our borders have been essentially closed for, uh, for over a year, uh, what recommendation would you have for Thailand based on what you've done in, in French Polynesia? Well, it's, uh, I'm very humble and I wouldn't uh, dare to give some uh, advice to, uh, to a country uh, as big as, as, as fantastic as Thailand in terms of tourism, but it's true that uh, both destinations uh, really heavily rely on, on tourism for their GDP. Uh, and uh, yes, if we have decided to open borders, it, it was courageous, but it was also, I think, a responsible decision that because we believe that in the long term, if we don't die from COVID because we are our borders are closed and we are protected, we die of hunger. And all the tourism industry, including thousands of little businesses, are censored or disappear. And, and this we wanted to absolutely avoid. Uh, in terms of assistance, um, France, of course, we have France who helped uh, with the extended uh, free loans. Uh, but this is indeed not enough. So our, our local uh, government, despite the reopening of, of tourism in July last year, 
decided to finance part of the salaries lost in the tourism sector. But in return, the employers, the hotels, et cetera, had to undertake to keep their employees so they could not uh, you know, dismiss them. Uh, and, and this government is also now supporting businesses in contributing to their fixed charges because it's taking so long that now they, they, have, they have no more reserve, no more cash flow. Um, so, of course, the only advice is, is to keep on uh, 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 applying very strict protocols uh, so that everyone is safe and everyone is, uh, is uh, reassured of what the country is doing. But this needs to involve the whole population, not only the industry and, of course, the, the, the government. Um, the thing which was uh, very important in our case was to never stop communicating with the trade and the stakeholders who absolutely needs to know what's going on, we need to be reassured, need to be supported. Uh, for example, we even went uh, with, our, with our government to Paris in October last year with our own president and the Minister of Tourism. Together, we went to meet the wholesalers just to say, look, guys, we love you. We're keeping the tidy for you. Please continue to come uh, and we will do everything we, 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 we can for you. So this, this is, uh, I think, very crucial. Yeah, I, I would uh, fully agree with you that uh, communication is really critical at the moment uh, for, for trade and uh, for, for people in general, just to constantly understanding how things are changing. As I said, uh, this crisis keeps evolving on a, almost on a daily basis. Things change uh, frequently and uh, communication is really critical. Uh, we're getting to a close for, for today's uh, event. Uh, but before we do so, I'd like to maybe just go back to Dorji for, for a very short answer. And I'll come back to you, Jean Marc. I believe we've we've lost uh, to you, but um, you know, what uh, what would you like the audience to remember from today's session uh, in terms of you know moving forward of uh, in terms of tourism in Bhutan, Georgia? Yeah, so Bhutan is a very different uh, country, definitely, and also with a very different uh, tourism policy that focuses on sustainable uh, tourism. And in the process, of course, Bhutan will be making a lot of sacrifices, especially the economic sacrifices we'll be making because we will be regulating the number uh, because normally the numbers get attacked with the uh, revenue. So therefore, for the last 50 years, we have been doing this sacrifice and we will continue to uh, do this. And then uh, that policy is going to go uh, continue. And also the other thing is, uh, we also like to say that uh, Bhutan, uh, the tourists have been seeing Bhutan as the last Shangri-La. So, so I think some of the comments that I see here on the chat is that maybe Bhutan is being our policies pro-rich or pro-elitist, and which I would like to say that while uh, I might agree also, but definitely I will be not uh, agreeing also, because in the sense that that's something that uh, we are, uh, uh, is a policy decision in the interest of the global sustainable uh, sustainability. So therefore, not everyone, anyone can come to Bhutan, like, and which is in a way true with other destinations also. For instance, even a Bhutanese, myself, if I, I also like to go to Switzerland, for instance, but to go to Switzerland, it would depend on my, uh, what kind of money I have, because the minimum money that I have to spend, uh, dollars that I've spent in previous Switzerland, I need to have this. So therefore, if I don't have that, definitely I cannot go to Switzerland. So therefore, it doesn't mean that Switzerland will also accept everybody coming there. So similarly for Bhutan also, while we would like to invite everyone, welcome everyone, but then there will be some criteria, I mean, uh, based on this. Because as, as I, sometimes I say, uh, let me conclude with this. Sometimes I say, like the door to heaven is open to everyone. Every human being is welcome to heaven. But then uh, to go to a heaven, actually, you need to earn certain merit while you are living uh, in this life. So therefore, Bhutan is a heaven, last Shangri-La, everybody's welcome, but then not, unfortunately, not everyone can come to Bhutan. I mean, you need to have to qualify certain requirements. So thank you very much, Mario. Well, if, uh, if uh, Bhutan and uh, the islands of Tahiti are heaven, I'd welcome to visit anytime, but the, the other heaven, I'd like to wait for a bit longer, if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Jean-Marc, uh, you, you have a closing remark. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say that we remain very optimistic here. Uh, booking for the high season, which is starting in June, are actually ahead of, uh, of uh, a regular year and uh, keep on coming. So we are pretty optimistic. Teddy has always been blessed by God in terms of attractivity. So, and it will always be the trip of most people dream to do at least once in a lifetime. So 
Uh, and the great thing is when you get here, it's even better than you know, the, on the postcard. And so not only due to the natural beauty of our islands, but also thanks to the people and the culture like you mentioned earlier. So uh, tourism uh, also, as we know, is one of the most resilient industry. Uh, therefore, when the pandemic is slowing down or when the vaccine will come, will, will be more uh, spread, more available. Uh, I'm totally convinced that destinations like ours, uh, the three destinations I'm talking about, are in, much, in a much better position to recover faster than many other destinations. Traveler wants to escape to the crowd, from the crowd. They are, um, they are also more looking for a slow type of tourism where they can live experience and reconnect with the essential. That's my putting it. Yeah, I would actually say to anyone who's been to Tahiti, I think they want to go back many, many times, not only once in their life. Uh, and uh, the same thing would apply with the other destinations here today. So thank you very much, both, uh, both of you, Dorji and John Mack, and also, of course, Toyib, who has left us, but for spending the time with us to share your views of what you, each one of your respective destinations has to offer uh, to all travelers and, and uh, businesses in, in the uh, industry, too. So. It's been a great pleasure to have you today. And I believe uh, Michaela wants to say a few words next. So thank you very much again. Uh, back over to you, Michaela. Mario, thank you very much. And thank you for your wonderful moderation and for your time and insight and in answering lots of questions as well. So thank you very much, Mario. Um, a big, big thank you to Doji of the Tourism Council of Bhutan, Jean-Marc of Tahiti Tourism and Toyip of uh, Visit Maldives. This marks the end of the session. Please feel free to end this call and log into my itinerary if you are participating to the Connections Virtual Week. Uh, make sure you log off and click onto your next meeting, but please make sure you're fully logged out of Zoom before connecting onto your next one-to-one -one meeting to avoid any technical difficulties. For everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. I found this session um, insightful, um, inspirational. I really want to visit all these wonderful places. Thank you very much again for joining and uh, goodbye.